Hi there, and welcome to Art for All, the Sketchbook School podcast. I am your host, Danny Gregory. Well, I'm your co-host, Danny Gregory. And I'm joined here today by the unmuted. Can you unmute yourself, John? I just did. Okay, good. I'm now unmuted. Yes, uh, I'm joined joined by my friend, John Muir Laws, who is going to introduce himself. Oh, hi there, everybody. I'm John Muir Laws. Um, Call me Jack. I am a, a naturalist, scientist, um, sketchbooker, and um, Danny's friend. And uh, so good to be uh, here with you this morning. Here after a week's vacation. So That's right. Yes. Uh, last week, when you were on vacation, normally I would have skipped it, but we just did skip a couple of weeks ago. So I decided to fill in with a solo podcast episode. I don't know if I told you that, but I did an episode where I just read a few essays to fill in the time so that we wouldn't uh, get the huge amount of uh, disappointed emails that we got when we just oh. skipped a week before. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I, I missed that, but I can catch that on the podcast. Um, of those, just uh, w- what was the most exciting thing you found yourself talking about? Well, I read some essays, and I think I think one of the essays that I read was about what it was like to move from New York to Los Angeles, hmm. uh, and it was called Coming to America, and it was about my experience that when I moved to Los Angeles, I realized that all these things that I've seen on TV and movies about the way America is, like the way people live their lives in America which to me I always thought was kind of something that the movies had made up. And then I realized that, no, that's actually how it is everywhere in America, except for New York. Not that Los Angeles is necessarily absolutely typical of America, but things like having a car, things like going to Costco, things like, um, you know, having a yard, all those kinds of things that, yes, I knew obviously people did that, but I hadn't really experienced what it was like until I moved to Los Angeles for a year. And now I live in Phoenix, which is even deeper in the heart of America than Los Angeles is. And uh, so, yeah, so that that was one of the things that I talked about. Nothing to do really with art. So much as to do with seeing, maybe. I don't know. I, I could stretch a reason for it being <laughs> um, relevant, but I just thought it was fun. So. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll enjoy checking that out. Yes. Have you had a chance to listen to the podcast yet? Did you? I did. Oh, did. I really? did. Um, what did you think? It's, uh, I, it was it was fun to to hear us playing around with ideas. That's good. Um, did you listen to it with your yeah. family in the car as you were driving to San Francisco? Uh, no, no. They uh, my my daughters want to, when the, the radio's on. They want uh, they want music. They like to be the uh, the radio DJs, oh. and um, they will select our stations. Um, and um, sometimes uh, we also will will have a podcast that we'll we'll explore together. So there you go. Um, so maybe we should do a musical episode so that you can listen to it with them. Oh, that'd be fun. I mean, you you are an, you are a ukuleleist, right? Um, I'm I'm a, a, uke, a, a ukuleleist in training. In training. Um, so both of the, the background with that is that both of my little daughters, uh, one is nine and one is 10, they, uh, were taking ukulele lessons. So violin and ukulele lessons. And I decided that, you know, I, I had kind of a, a fixed mindset about my ability to handle music. And what if I faced that in front of them? Mm-hmm. And so I joined their ukulele lessons. And so the three of us take ukulele lessons together. They both are much better than I am. And Nana, so we don't I say am, that. Well, well, I would say they, they've been doing it longer than I yeah. have. They can play the notes that they intend to play. Um, they're timing they can read music um i would say i do not i have not developed those skills yet and the but i want them to see me struggle 
I also want to learn to play the ukulele. Um, so I am, I am struggling in plain sight. Um, and that's a, that's part of the goal of me learning to play ukulele. It's also lear learning to play the ukulele, but I want them to, to watch me try something, see that there are things that dad can't do yet. And that I'm still working at it and that I am getting better. So just as part of that kind of complex of thinking about how do we teach growth mindset, um, I decided to tackle that fear of, of, of music. And, um, and well, we've got, we've got a recital coming up <laughs> in, um, in uh, less than a month. So I am, uh, I'm going to be, I am motivated to, to work on it and work on it with them. We're going to try to do. It's a good example you're setting for them. Yeah. So, it's, but it's now, it's don't, I always think of you, you, ukulele as really needing to accompany singing. That's usually how, that's usually how it's used. It's not like, you don't really want to sit down and listen to a ukulele album. It's not, it doesn't have enough resonance to it, but am I wrong? Well, uh, that, that, I, the ukulele is a surprisingly versatile little instrument, mm -hmm. and there's different styles that you can do. Um, <clears throat> so we are we are learning um, we're learning instrumental pieces. We're learning some pieces that you can sing to. Um, we're learning "Oba di Oba da" by the not the Oba Beatles. Oba da" by the Beatles. Oh, um, we're learning "Wipeout." Um, really wipe out yeah, that then, seems i guess that yeah yes and um that that is that is a, that's a that's a challenge and um we're also learning some uh classical instrumental gu guitar pieces that have um have been adapted for the for the ukulele and um, it's got a lot of different moods and, 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 and voices. So there's people who really have, have, have learned to, to, to talk with this instrument um, can create beautiful music. Um, and actually sometimes on, a, on sort of a, I will put just ukulele, this ukulele, uh, instrumental pieces by several of our, our favorite ukulele players um, on our uh, kind of uh, home music system. And we'll just have them playing in the background so the girls get exposed to like, you can do that with a ukulele. You'd be, you'd be, you'd, you'd be surprised that it's, it's, it's got, it's got some, it's got a lot of depth. It's a very millennial instrument. I mean, it's, YouTube abounds with like people playing the ukulele and sort of very sensitive girls playing the ukulele. And, you know, it used to be, you would just think of it as like Hawaiian guys, but now it's like become sort of the singer songwriter in training kind of instrument of choice, not to be derisive and not to be like an old guy pointing that out. But yeah, that's, that's where I, that's where I associate it with now. It's like, it's a very much of a, of, of the last five years, 10 years kind of instrument. Well, I sure am enjoying it. Yeah, no, I think and, it's great. Uh, I, it yeah. is it is stretching my brain and my wheels, and uh, I'm going to stick up for the ukulele. My son and I took uh, guitar lessons for a while when he was probably like 10 or 11, probably the same age as your daughters. And then our our guitar player like fell in love with some girl in Texas and decided to leave New York, and oh. that was the end of it. So that kind of, that ended our, our commitment. He then took up the drums and um, that was it. And I ended up uh, taking up the being a dad of a guy who's playing the drums in the house kind of role. Yeah, which is always a challenge too. Or being the neighbor of a guy whose son plays the drums is also challenging. But anyway, so. Yeah, check out uh, uh, Jake Shimabakuro. Um, as somebody who wait, how do you, you can, say that again? Uh, um, 
Shimabakuru. Shimabakuru. I'm probably mispronouncing it, but it's S H I M A B U K U R O. Right. You'll have to send and, that to, uh, link to me, and we'll put that in the show notes because I'm. And uh, yeah, he. Yeah, uh, I don't remember it otherwise. Um, yeah, that sounds good. There's also there was also like a great English ukulele player in like the 30s and 40s who was a huge star at the time. Um, his name was it skiffle is that the type of music that they used to play yeah skiffle. i don't know yeah look at look up skiffle music that skiffle, skiffle. okay the beatles started as a skiffle band speak if you're into the beatles yeah from what i remember anyway i don't now now that we're talking about the beatles i'm getting depressed so let's move on to something else you're, you're depressed i'm not you know i'm not a beatles fan you're not a beatles one of the fan. few people who's not a beatles fan yeah, I was. I had. I suffered a lot of trauma around Beatles music. I think I don't know what it is. It's not something I can't explain, but I, um, I've suffered it. Now I'm going to get emails with people saying, "But the Beatles are the best," which is so redundant. Um, yes, <laughs> the Beatles are awesome. Love them. No, not anyway. Speaking of trauma, I thought an interesting subject for us to tackle today would be high school. We don't have to talk about it from a traumatic point of view, but high school is, a, is an interesting time in most creative people's lives um, in a lot of different ways. And I thought that that might be a subject that we could delve into. We could talk about our, um, what kind of high school did you go to? Um, I went to an alternative high school in San Francisco. It was in a, it was started in the sixties by a few hippies kind of created a co-op um, school and it grew. They moved into a firehouse, uh, firehouse theater. And then the school kind of grew up around that. We had, we're on the block system. So I would have for two and a half hours, uh, one class take an hour and a half for lunch, which was sometimes subsumed by classes that were going on field trips. Then we had uh, another two and a half hour class and you do those for six weeks or so and then change your two classes um, some really dedicated teachers and some alternative teaching styles so we were not getting grades we were getting um, narrative evaluations you'd evaluate yourself and uh, the teacher would write a written evaluation it was a kind of a, a different sort of uh, school experience. So were you on the football team? <laughs> we did not have a football team. Um, we had an ultimate Frisbee team. Um, and there was nobody for us to compete against. Um, and uh, we eventually there was a basketball team. Oh. Um, but I was not part of that. Um, I liked to just kind of run on my own. And so I would, I could go do that. But uh, yeah, there was not a big sports, there was not a big sports focus at that time at the school. Interesting. It sounds, it, in some ways, it's a lot like the school I went to. That's interesting. So were, you, were your parents hippies of some kind? Well, um, they were hippies with ties. Hippies with ties. Um, right? So they, oh, we were Jerry growing Wood. up in the hate district in San Francisco. Um, so uh, shortly after the 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 summer of of my, my of of love, they moved into um, on moved in on Stanion Street, right right above Haight Nashbury, and um, they did all of the they did pro bono legal work to get the Haight Ashbury Free Clinic up and going, mm -hmm. and were part of that in the Haight-Ashbury Neighborhood Council. It was a, uh, so they had, they had deep hippie roots. They were both lawyers, hippie lawyers. Um, Interesting. but they were also involved with uh, civil rights and workers' rights and um, helped get that, uh, the, the free medical clinic going there in the middle of of, of Haight Ashbury. So they had ties, but they also had ties to the, uh, the, the, 
the the hippie hipsters. But boom, boom, interesting. So, so your high school, how many people were in your class? In my class, I think there are 160 people in the whole school. So you had, and it was just a high school. And I don't know if that number is correct, but for some reason that number sticks in my head. It seems high to me. Um, was that was that a whole high school? Was it just a high school, or was it kindergarten through twelve? Just that was just the high school. Yeah. So about forty people per class. I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that seems about right. That's interesting because so I went to a Quaker school. So which is, you know, in some ways. I mean, it was. I mean, it was partly the time. I mean, I went. I went to high school in the mid seventies, and um, I went to. It was called Brooklyn Friends School. It still is. It's still there. It's been around since the nineteenth century, and um, it's. It was Quaker to the extent that we had morning meeting every morning. That would be like, and we would have silence. But other than that, there wasn't really a lot of Quaker stuff going on. But we were in downtown Brooklyn in. We were ironically in what used to be the Brooklyn Law School building, um, and it was it went from kindergarten through twelfth grade. So my sister actually went there through all thirteen years, but I started there in eighth grade. I I went to the school when I was um, I had just come from to America in eighth grade. So I, I it was the summer of before eighth grade I came there. And um, I had been, before that, I'd been living in Israel, and I had gone to an Israeli school that was all in Hebrew. Before that, I'd been in Pakistan. Before that, I'd been in Australia. So this, I was like dropped into the deep end of, um, of this American high school. But as I said, it was, it was unusual. Um, we also, we had, we didn't have grades. We had um, pass-fail and honors. So pass-fail, honors. And um, we would have what were called white slips, which are written evaluations. So that's what your grades were. Which at first I thought was going to be a challenge when it came to applying to high school, uh, to college, because we didn't have grades. So we didn't have like a, I didn't have a GPA. There was none of that stuff. Um, And it was, you had lots of choices. We had a lot of choices when it came to, you know, what you could take. And there were, there was like a period I think every term when they would have, oh, in between terms, they had like a term where you could focus on something unusual. So you could focus on like, just take one class where you would just do something like make a graphic novel or learn about the life cycle of an earthworm, whatever it was, and just be focused Mm -hmm. on that. Um, And every so often we would have a teacher that had come in from another kind of school, like our chemistry teacher had taught in a Brooklyn public school, and he would be pretty serious about stuff and it would take a while for the school to kind of break him of that you know <laughs> like having pop quizzes and stuff like that and after a while i was like no we just kind of none of us really do that but um so yeah so it was pretty free form there was an there was a a space called free space free space was set up by these two teachers uh paul pector and don canise paul pector was sort of an art teacher and Don Kniss was my English teacher. He actually ended up becoming the head of the upper school. But they were both like, again, this is like late 70s. So they were very sort of, you know, experimental and looking for experimental things to do. So free space was like a place you could go to and you could do whatever you want. And hmm. my friends and I started uh, sort of an underground mimeographed magazine called Friends Uncensored because we were very into like, we will not be, we will not be censored. And it's like, nobody was censoring us, but whatever we will like, we will be. And so we, we were very influenced by underground comics. So we made like an underground sort of thing where we, I think like used swear words and like occasionally drew what we thought was nudity and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, And then I remember like, but Paul, who was in the main guy in charge of it, he was like, he was very much of a hippie guy. He was like a, he was an ardent socialist, communist socialist, uh, intellectual. He was also an artist, but I'm not sure what kind of art he really made. And we actually started a Marx Engels study circle, and we would meet in after school. We would meet and 
study Marx and Engels. Ironically, at that point, my parents had come into some kind of a windfall and they had rented this really lavish house that had been the house that J.P. Morgan had lived in when he was a child. So we were meeting in J.P. Morgan's house, studying Marx and Engels in the study circle. Wow. And um, yeah. And then Paul, eventually, I think like my senior year, I think he quit and went to work in a factory because he wanted to be like a member of the proletariat. So he went and worked in a factory and then he ended up working in a munitions factory. So he was building some kind of armaments. I don't know what that was. And I was sort of like, really? I thought you were like a man of the people, but now you're building bombs. It was all very weird. Um, Don Canise, who is their English teacher, he, one of the more interesting things he did was one day during morning meeting, he came up with this idea that most kids had never seen a grown man shave. So, so he decided that he would shave off his beard in front of the entire school in school assembly. <laughs> so he went up and he and, shaving as perform yeah. grooming as performance. He had like art. a big beard and he shaved it off. He cut himself really badly. He was like bleeding, cutting, oh. cut himself off. It was, it was, well, he hadn't had much practice because he'd been growing that beard. He'd been growing the beard. I don't think he had a mirror. And you know, I don't know if you ever had cut off a beard. It's it's quite a job to cut off a beard. And yeah. uh, he did it in front of all these children, essentially, yeah, the, the, watching him cut off the beard. Yeah, you know, shaving your stubble down is a different thing when there, when then if there's actually some fluff. Yeah, there. yeah, I think he had like use scissors and then, you know, but yeah. yes, but that was like <laughs> one of so that was sort of fairly typical of part of the school was that kind of thing. And then free space, we also so we made the magazine. We also, I remember I learned to draw on film. Like we got this these rolls of clear film. And you could, um, so you could draw like with ink and markers and then run it through a projector and it'd be like, you know. Make your lightsabers. Yeah. You, or you could like, um, you know, try and make something look like it was moving. And we did claymation and things like that. But we also, um, yeah, but I think there was like, people would also smoke pot. Like there, A lot of things went on that were various. Mm -hmm. But that was kind of the cool place to hang out. But then. So that was one of the, like, what were your art experiences like in high school? Um, well, the, the art program was, you know, there, there's sort of one one school of of thought in in art um, was th that that everybody has their kind of inner muse, and all you have to do is get out of the way of that inner muse, and um then they will 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 do art from there um so they they would kind of front load with a little bit of betty edwards um so some drawing on the right side of the brain you know i i drew that picture of that the guy sitting in the chair upside Stravinsky down by picasso there we go and so um i i drew that upside down and from that point on they just said like here's art supplies go go draw um and so there, it was not very structured, except there was this life drawing class. I signed up for this life drawing class, and that for a high school kid was a that was a, an an eye opener. Like naked ladies. Yes, <laughs> yes. That <laughs> we I, I came into class. I had my little easel. I had my little piece of chalk, and um, a woman came into the room and uh, got up on a platform and took off her robe and there's a naked person there and i am like 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 I, I i can't look at you because that would be rude but i have to look at you because i need to draw my picture but now in order to draw my picture of you i need to really look at you and <laughs> so it was there was a lot going on <laughs> yep that, those are the days of uh, hormonal surges too yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yes. There was a lot going on. <laughs> yes. I went actually. I went to the Rhode Island School of Design summer program when I was fifteen, and uh, that was kind of like sort of the end of my career as a person who drew and painted around that time. Probably because like when I went to this thing, everybody was everybody was like the best person in their high school. Mm. You know, that, and I only went because that, I, that's hard. Yeah, I went there because I had a friend who had gone there the year before and he was like the cool guy who I looked up to. And he was the one who um, introduced me to Robert Crumb 
and Frank Frazetta and a bunch of other um, kind of graphic novel people and uh, Frank Zappa, uh, Captain Beefheart, those kinds of people. But but um, he so he went there and then I was like, OK, I'm going to try and go there. So I, I spent the summer there and that was like, yeah, we did all those kinds of things. And we were living like on a college campus when we were 15 you know, in dorms and yeah, it was, it was, I have a lot of memories from that summer, very few of which have to do with art. So, <laughs> but yeah, that was a good time. Um, but yeah, I think in high school we had, I mean, again, my art at my school in general was certainly uh, encouraging to creative people, but there was still definitely like the art set, art guys, art, girls mainly and um the non-art people and i but i tried lots of different kinds of art i mean i um i learned to make jewelry i learned to do some enamel make like silver jewelry i learned to do some enamel stuff i did mm -hmm. some ceramics and um so, yeah some painting i guess probably and printmaking and just like dabbling in lots of different things, you know, lots of different resources. And um, it's yeah. fun to be able to do that. I think we had some of those same sort of things you were mentioning ceramics. We also had a, a linoleum cutting thing where we do printmaking with linoleum cutting. And that was sort of a process of all the students learning not to put their hand in front of the yeah. knife that they were pressing hard with. So everybody was just slicing their hands to pieces that's a rite of passage definitely oh yes yeah. it's it's lucky that i ended up with all of my digits um but uh yeah i was constantly jabbing myself with my little linoleum cutting tool i don't think we had you know quite the safety briefing that um they might do now if they still let people do linoleum cuts did you did you feel like pursuing art was encouraged or discouraged i think it was encouraged i think it was encouraged um but there just, there just wasn't very much structure with it there was access to tools which is great i think there's there's kind of a this this balance on on one hand there's giving people structure and scaffolding on the other hand there is giving people freedom and opportunity and experience and i think the ideal um, combination of those you 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 have you'd have a ideally you'd have a combination of those this was fairly high on the freedom and sort of access to art supplies and and experience but less so on any kind of scaffolding and and structure it's interesting though isn't it it's because it's kind of like other disciplines and i don't know what this was like in your school but history chemistry biology math, language, um, were structured, right? I mean, yes. literature, I mean, you'd, you'd have a book to read, you'd have the Norton Anthology, you'd have, you'd have, you know, papers you had to write, even though we were loosey-goosey when it came to grades, you had a teacher, you had to do these things. When it came to art, it was just sort of like, well, here's the stuff, go and do it. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, so the question is like, is it kind of infantilized? Is it sort of like, you know, we can't really teach you stuff, so you know. But we have art; is art's important, so we have some of it. But well, I I think that there was there there was the notion that I think became very strong, maybe in the '60s, perhaps it was before that, that if you taught people any techniques, then you're going to this. Everybody would be kind of a clone, right? Um, but of course, you know, that's not true in literature. You teach people rules of grammar and those sort of things, and then let them do writing. And then you can choose to break those rules, kind of knowing what they were. It's the, the same is true with art. But I, I think that people were very, very afraid of the idea that you would somehow stifle people's inner flame by g giving any kind of scaffolding or structure. And so I think that perhaps there was a time where the pendulum had swung the other way, and that might have been a, a, a reaction to it. Um, 
and the you know seeing that you know people could create all sorts of really interesting interesting things with um without formal training was surprising to people but i, I remember it wasn't until really really kind of late in my i was already out of college before i got to classes um it was when i took the scientific illustration course this postgraduate scientific illustration course in in santa cruz where people were talking about like all right you know here are some here's some practical kind of a flow chart of how you might want to approach drawing this and um there were you know I, I i never learned you know formal perspective or any of those sorts of things even in those classes um but uh yeah it's interesting isn't it? it's like it's like yeah. because even if you think about sports you know i i mean if you were on the football team you would have i'm sure had drills and you would have had strategies and you would have had you know things you were practicing if you were traumatic brain injury <laughs> exactly. you would have um you know so i think it's not like just that it was extracurricular um but when it came to art i mean i i agree i think i think it is partly a function of this sort of 60s and 70s time in art when it was really about um, performance art and abstract art and a lot of things where the emphasis was on self-expression, which I think is still important. Um, mm -hmm. But again, as you say, it's like you wouldn't have expected somebody to be a writer, not only not knowing grammar, but not even not knowing letters. Right. Um, right. And I think the expectation was when you were five, six, seven, and you were making art in school that you knew how to do it. You just, here's a box of crayons, you know how to do it. And that, which is true. I mean, we all know to some extent how to do some of that stuff, but I think then there was never a sense that it had um, a practical application. That there was, you know, that, and, and probably, and this is sort of um, conspiracy theory minded, but there probably wasn't a huge interest in getting a lot of people to become really involved with being artists. You know, you don't, you don't want a school that's like churning out lots of artists. That's, that's, you know, counter to really the whole purpose of school, which was ultimately to get us to, to have real jobs. And um, so, you know, I think having thousands of illustrators, and it's interesting, I just read this book, which was made into a TV show called um, Mozart in the Jungle. And this book, which is also called Alt Mozart in the Jungle, and the TV show, by the way, had nothing to do with this book. But the book is about a woman who's an oboist, and it's about her whole life. She's a professional oboist and about the world of classical music. And one of the key things about this is there's this kind of machine that identifies or encourages people to become classical musicians and work very hard at it, right? To become real perfectionists about their technique and to learn all these things. It's very, very hard work, right? You know, you can imagine like somebody starting to learn a classical music, classical instrument when they're very young, working really, really hard at it. And then ultimately, you know, ending up taking a lot of classes and then maybe ending up in, um, you know, in a school, a music, what's it called? A conservatory. And then trying out for orchestras. And basically, there are far more people in conservatories than there are jobs in in orchestras um, oh, and yeah. so and it takes so much work that she talks a lot in this book about what it was like to basically not know anything except music like she didn't know basic math she didn't know she had worked so hard from such a young age and put all of her energy into learning this skill and then kind of didn't know much of else of anything and then ended up kind of struggling to live to survive because the opportunities in the world of classical music are really pretty limited. The uh, revenue stream is really limited. It, you know, the people at the very top make a lot of money, but the vast majority of people really struggle and they have multiple jobs. It's a, it's a, I don't know, it's a controversial book. I think a lot of people who 
have said she's just a whinger and uh, she's not really representative. But it is interesting to think about, here's a person who was trained as a, I guess you could say an artist, but also really trained as a technician, a creative technician, right? Technical skills, craftsperson. Um, and just how challenging that can be ultimately. So in some ways, maybe we were spared that, you know, if we had had really intensive drawing and painting classes from the beginning, maybe that would have been problematic too. I, um, perhaps. Um, but I, I think that it also a part of what has gone on is that art came to be seen as a separate discipline from mathematics. Um, if, you, if you look at, say, the relationship between music and mathematics, right. like, like, really, you're going to teach music without teaching mathematics. Like, you're going to teach mathematics, you're not going to teach the music. Wow, that's an interesting decision. Mm -hmm. Think about the relationship between thinking and visualization, right? That, that art itself is a thinking tool. It's not just for presentation of something, but it's a tool which we can use to think about the world around us. And if you have visual thinking strategies, in your brain, you can apply those to any phenomena in business or science or whatever you're engaging with. And it is going to be useful. The way we think with words is just different than the way we think with pictures. And, but if we take that, those arts out, then we're saying, let's teach you how to think but we're only going to use this limited set of tools and then see how well you do. And I know that in the sciences, there's actually a lot of interest now in bringing arts back into how we think about science because people are realizing that visualization of all these things from, a, from the structure of a molecule um, to uh, uh, the, 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 the motion of currents, you need to be able to visualize this stuff. And if you don't practice that stuff, you don't have any chops with that. It's really hard to do. So people have even set up their shingle as I am a science visualization um, specialist and that they will help you see your data and think about things visually. But mm. the scientists themselves could have been doing that actually they still can but it's going to just sort of take them you know take the you know the the humility of starting to learn to think about things visually again yeah that's, i mean i think um, i mean i know that in some medical schools i don't know if it's a general thing but but doctors are encouraged to draw when they're you know say you know uh, studying anatomy or when they're doing a dissection that they're that or when they're looking through a microscope that they're encouraged to draw what they're seeing because it enhances your ability to visualize it, and you're, you're by drawing what you're seeing you're seeing better and that's obviously a, a crucial right. thing for men for a doctor or a scientist i think you know there's there's been some attempts to do this in in business in the business world to um certainly you know product development or um, even to design, even to lay out an idea to do visual, you know, using um, brain mapping kinds of tools to make visual connections between things. Um, and I think also exp in explaining things, the equivalent of like a chalk talk or, you know, drawing on a whiteboard and explaining things through pictures as you're drawing and mood boards and things like that, some of it. But I think, again, you have people who have never developed those skills so they've never had them. So their first reaction is, I don't know how to draw, and then I'm going to look like an idiot in, in business context, and, and I don't want to do that, so I only want to show what I'm good at. So I won't even use those tools to unpack ideas, to explore connections, mm -hmm. to explain things to people. I mean, certainly using visuals to 
explain a process is, you know, a given. So I think that, I think that it is something that has held us back. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it would seem like a very useful thing for schools to teach people that it would yeah. be a thing that, yeah. that we could use in all different kinds of ways. And, um, you know, but we don't. Yeah. So hard to kind of get that later on as an adult, not because our brain can't learn it, but as you're describing, we have a fear of the vulnerability of being a beginner at anything in front of our peers and that we kind of value ourselves and identify ourselves by our competencies. And so kind of stepping into the vulnerable space of, I'm going to make a little drawing of this and it doesn't look like a squirrel. Um, and putting that up on the whiteboard is that's, that's a vulnerability that a lot of people aren't willing to, to, to take. Yeah. I mean, I experienced it in advertising a lot. So in advertising, you have basically when you're quote unquote, a creative person, you are either, you're put into a bucket. You're either a copywriter or you're an art director. If you're a copywriter, your domain is words. You write the headline, you write the body copy, you write the script. If you're an art director, you're in charge of the look of the thing, the photography, the design, the typography, etc. There's a certain amount of overlap between those things because you have a lot of people who are able to do both or able to move back and forth between the two. I was a copywriter, but I would, I could draw. So, you know, or I would, or I would draw, I, like I didn't care about doing a bad drawing. So if I wanted to do a, a, a storyboard and what I discovered was a lot of people who are art directors, whose job it is to man manage the visual end of things, weren't comfortable drawing. Mm. A lot of times they would hire a storyboard artist or they would, hi they would hire um, a com some computer technician, really, to build the thing, and they would just explain in words what it was. And I think part of that was they were all obviously people who had gone to art school, design school, presumably had drawn in high school, but when they got to the professional level, felt they weren't good enough at drawing, like, that it would compromise, you know, their standing because the feeling was like, well, you're in charge of the look of this thing. And yet look at how terrible your drawings are. So um, it was always interesting to me. So I could kind of get away with it because I wasn't supposed to be in charge mm -hmm. of that. Because you're the word guy. Yeah, exactly. So, but here's just a little sketch. It's kind of like a dog, like, you know, you have a dog who can talk and that's pretty miraculous. But then there comes a point where you say, well, what is the dog actually saying? And that's kind of stupid because mm -hmm. the dog isn't that smart. Yeah, nobody, nobody's they're, they're they're going look at that a talking dog rather than getting into the nitty gritty of the conjugation. Of exactly. Birds. So so I was I was a dog who could talk, and that was enough. Um, so, but so but but I think again, it's like this essential skill. It was being judged on the wrong criteria. So we're judging right. the ability to draw based on like, well, is that like a good piece of art as opposed to, is that a good explanation? And that's, that's its purpose. That's its purpose for most of, that's its purpose when you're five, six, seven years old and you're drawing with crayons, you're using drawing really to explore, to communicate, to imagine, you're not trying to create great art. And so as we are getting older, that, that, that the, 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 the pressure of how things should look starts to grow, it starts to loom in our heads. And if we, you know, decide that I am going to, I'm going to, uh, you know, I, I haven't drawn in years, but maybe I'll take this up. Um, now we're looking at things which we consider works of art and sort of judging ourselves against that criteria rather than thinking about this, this, you know, making a sketch of this in my, my, my journal here, it's going to help me remember this moment, or it is going to help me think about this in a different way, or it's going to help me see some detail that I otherwise wouldn't have seen. 
if we can keep our focus on that, um, I, I, it just gives us so much more license to 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 get out the journal, to get out the piece of paper and the pencil, and to make marks and have those be useful to us. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point of view. This utility. And I think utility can also extend to expression because you can also say, mm -hmm. I'm feeling a certain way. And if I do a drawing, that might help me to um, unearth what's going on with me or to have some kind of perspective on it. It's not about art in that sense. It's not about the things that we associate with art. It's really about exploration, discovery, uh, analysis, and so forth. And I think also high school and it probably starts even earlier, middle school, intermediate, uh, junior high school, whatever, um, 11, 12, 13, that age is when it starts to shift, right? And you start to shift to critique judgmentalism, how you appear to others, whether you're pretend, you know, whether you, oh, your drawing is terrible, all those kinds of things. And then, I mean, I think a lot of, a lot of art that you see in high school is fairly conservative. I think there's a lot of emphasis on um, can, does can you draw well? So mm -hmm. right, so you'll see like you know the typical sort of like I drew like a movie star, you know, like hey that right. looks just like right. you know, whoever, and and you spend a lot of time doing it, and that's what you would show off was that kind of art. So art that was figurative representation right because that's a suggested skill you know and yeah and you don't want to be like a you don't you don't want to draw attention to yourself that's a lot of what high school is about you're finding your identity but you want to make sure but you you're feeling very fragile about it right and you don't want to um you know you don't want to be doing this too much in public so i think you're much more vulnerable and so you're more risk averse in a lot of ways. It's ironic because you think of adolescents being risk takers, but in other ways, they're also conservative in that way. They don't want to to draw too much attention to themselves in some ways, particularly if they're going to screw up. The option yeah. to screw up more and more the, the 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 pressure of kind of judgment of our peers, um, and what are perceived ex uh, what we perceive their expectations of us to be. Um, those those grow in our in our heads. It's something that is kind of a, an interesting counterpart to this. Is I find that with the the students that I work with, very often um, elders are then able again to let go of a bunch of those judgments and will be all in and try things and people a decade or two younger are still ah just it's it's too scary what what have, have you noticed that yeah too? i think it's uh, i think it's to do with what's going on with i think that? it's to do with identity i think i think if you're 50 60 70 and you start making art um by and large you kind of Know who you are you know i think by then you're you're reasonably confident about your position your your status your identity um those kinds of things you're less um unsure of yourself so you can afford to take risks in certain areas more so um there's less at stake you know nobody cares that much when you're in high school you feel like everybody's watching you everybody wants to know what you're doing um, and everybody's judging you, which isn't particularly true. But I mean, it is true when you're in high school, like you are getting grades constantly, you are being judged in a way that as an adult, you don't experience quite so much. So you generally want to focus on things that you think you're going to do well at. That's, you know, you're constantly being evaluated. So you, you would, why would you purposefully do something that you know you're going to fail at? When you're older, you can afford to fail because who cares? Again, this is not universally true. I mean, I've met people who are 90 who are still anxious and, and worried about what will people think about what they're doing, or I'm no good at this. But I think generally, we've kind of moved beyond that. We don't, we don't care anymore. You know, 
it's the sort of like ladies in purple hats. Isn't that a thing? Is it ladies in purple hats? It's like a phenomenon of like, you know, you reach a certain age and you're like, tell whether I'm going to, you know, have a blue lock of hair or I'm going to wear ridiculous colors or I'm going to be bold and I'm going to speak my opinion and those kinds of things. Like you get to a point where you're just like, I'm going to be me. I'm not, I'm tired of being worried so much about what other people think. Um, so I think that's generally a phenomenon. I think, I think women have it probably more than men too. Women have, uh, they reach a point where they feel, I mean, maybe women just have more encumbrances upon them. Like there's more limitations that they have. So there's more things to throw off than men have, um, you know, so they can, they, they are, can, they can be feel more liberated. I don't know if I don't, men have midlife crises that are different. Like they're combating the age yeah. aging thing, but uh, I don't think they have quite the sense of like I'm not really being who I want to be, and now I finally get to be that. I know that uh, sort of being being a guy, there are I do feel lots of sort of societal pressure to. Um, to be strong, competent, confident, and that, you know, the, that doesn't leave a lot of room for playful dabbling. Sort of that sort of typ typical kind of, you know, act like a man box um, doesn't leave a lot of room and space for that. Doesn't that begin when you're in high school, though, that... <clears throat> that sense of like be a man and uh you know well, i i think that you're the the pressure you're getting for that starts you know even earlier than that it's 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 everywhere in every movie that you 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 see well not every movie but in but ma many 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 movies i mean that, sports are all about that right? sports television shows um the comics that kids are reading of everything is kind of feeding us these 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 kind of a narrative of who we should be and um part of that is that you are confident you are capable and you are um Kind of, uh, you know, clear on what you're doing, and uh, that's society's expectation. Society wants you. Yeah, exactly. Society wants to know where you're going to fit in. Um, you know, childish put childish things aside, and but I think also high school is this time of identity, finding your identity, and, you're, and a lot of finding the identity is based on seeing what others are doing with their identity. So you might, you know, what's cool, how, you know, where do you fit in. How do you determine, you know, what are the markers that you have to like, what do you, how do you do your hair? What do you, what kind of clothes do you wear? You know, do you smoke cigarettes? Do you, what, what are the things that you do that define your identity? And having an identity as an artist or as a creative person isn't, is somewhat problematic in high school. People don't quite know what to do with it. Um, I think that there's always like the art group in and the art group can often be the weirdos, right? Or they can be kids wearing black, kids wearing black, or just um, kids not fitting in neatly. And those kids might go off and they might go to art school. They might drop out of school. They might do who knows what. I think there's generally a feeling that they may turn into something positive, hopefully, but that they're going, they're not fitting neatly into what is expected they're not fitting neatly into the whole purpose of high school which is to prepare you to go to college and then prepare you to get a job and fit in that's very much what the the overall sense of it is it's not about cultivating free expression right. it's not a, it's not necessarily about suppressing it but culturally there is a lot of suppression of that right there's people in, you know you you want to be like you know this this the student who does well and so, so I think that that's a lot of what's going on. Um, and I think when we're older, 
Society doesn't really care. If you're 60 and you want to go off and play the ukulele or learn to watercolor or do whatever, who cares? Like you're not, you're not going to, you know, you're, you're just, you're irrelevant, honestly. That's really why nobody cares because you don't count that much anymore. You've, you've made your contribution. You've reproduced. You've, you know, had your career. You've done all the, the things that society values in you. And now you're older, whatever. Ironically, though, more and more people are living longer and longer. Older people generally have more resources. They do, they do matter, actually, economically in many different ways. Um, and in general, the birth rate is going down. So there are, older people have more and more influence in our society. And um, so some of those things are going to change. And this idea that, well, what's going to happen if you become creative later in your life? What, what's, what are you going to do with that? How's that going to affect society? You're going to go off and be, have become a, an artist in a gallery. Are you going to go off and start some kind of creative company? Probably not. It's, you know, it's fine if you like decide to watercolor in your spare bedroom. Nobody really cares. But you care. It's your life. It's your expression of who you are. It's your discovery. You may have some regret that you hadn't done that earlier, perhaps, but you do matter. And you can influence the world with your art if you choose to, because you do have a platform now to do it. Right? That is, there is an opportunity to share your art, to influence and affect other people. And, um, you know, that's the power of the internet is you can make stuff and other people can see it in a broad way that wasn't the case when you were in high school. So in some ways, you can, you can be more of an individual. You can express your identity and state it publicly. You can be subversive. You can have an impact. You can do a lot of things that you may have thought about doing in high school, but you had your whole life ahead of you. Don't ruin it now. Now, maybe you don't have your whole life ahead of you, so you can afford to take more of a risk. Uh, again, we think, of, we think of older people as being more conservative, but I think there's also an opportunity to be more um, radical or at least authentic and to be less preoccupied with the prevailing expectation. I don't know. Maybe I'm just saying that because I'm old. <clears throat> I like that thought. Um, and also, perhaps, then how can we also give ourselves, and if we're younger, um, or, our, or our kids, or our students, the permission to, to bring art into their lives as as a kind of a, a core part of how they experience the world and as an opportunity to create and think using um, using art as 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 the expression or the tool but maybe it's not up to school to do that you know because um, kids are starting YouTube channels and doing TikTok things and Instagram and all like kids are finding ways of doing this that have nothing to do with school. So all these all these creative resources that we needed, we needed places to make jewelry and ceramics and all that stuff. Maybe they don't need it anymore. Maybe they can get it elsewhere. And I, I always feel like when I see technology and even video and things like that being taught in schools, it never seems to be quite at the same, at the right level. It always feels a little, a little archaic just because they don't have the resourcing to do um, you know, to fund them getting the right tools, but kids could get those tools for themselves. Because right now you can take your phone and you can make a movie with it. And you can take your phone and you can share your, take a photo of your drawing and share it with the world. You can make, take your phone and play a ukulele and record a song and put it on YouTube or put it on SoundCloud and a lot of people can hear it. So do we need school to do any of that stuff? Maybe not. Maybe we just need to, you know, let kids do what they're going to do. Because I think, I think the fact is that there are huge changes afoot for anybody who's in high school now and what their future is going to be. School is no longer able to prepare you for the future in quite the way that it was when we were in school because nobody knows what the future is going to be. So we could learn these essential skills in school because, of, because the assumption was that if you learn what people learned a generation before you, you'll be fine. But now, right, but now learning 
um, learning about the world in high school may not be the most useful thing, you know, that it, that the, those, those, I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying, I'm, I'm, whether I'm correct or not, but I've always had this feeling that it's very, very difficult for education to keep up with the change that is happening in the world. Yeah, well, especially with the kind of just wholesale access to facts and information. Yeah. Um, I think perhaps that we can focus on the kind of critical things to get out of school is how can I process and evaluate information? So it's not that I necessarily have to have all these things memorized, but I need to be able to separate the wheat from the chaff, the significant from the irrelevant, and be able to have a way of, of synthesizing those together to make meaning and to make understanding. Which brings me back to the power of art the power of visual thinking in this endeavor, I think is, is huge. And if, if we're just trying to get, have people kind of hold things in their head or just use words as a way of kind of writing down lists to kind of keep track of things, as opposed to making diagrams, as opposed to um, making uh, pictures and, and, and icons to help us synthesize this this mass of information um i think we're doing a a, a disservice i think that that those those tools need to be um yeah that, that the landscape is changing and having a flexible suite of cognitive tools that you can use to make meaning out of things um is all the more important and all the more relevant today. Yeah, I agree. Learning to use tools, and I don't mean learning to use particular pieces of software or anything like that, but I think learning right. learning systems, learning how to think, how to process thoughts, learning the, basically the, the framework for thinking as opposed to the content, because the content... Mm -hmm. going to be changing. There's also so many other ways for people to learn now that didn't used to exist. YouTube is full of gazillions of tutorials on anything you can think of. There's so many people explaining how things can be done that are really, really valuable. So, you know, I think schools need to acknowledge all that stuff, you know, and I think, for instance, you know, there's this kind of a revolution that happened with the Khan Academy, so I don't know if you know what the Khan Academy is. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So yes. the Khan Academy, for those who don't know, is basically um, videos that explain, it started with mathematics, explain math, um, physics, science, a lot of other things. I think they have now branched out to explain, some, I don't know, more what we used to call liberal arts stuff too. But basically, here's a tutorial, video tutorial that a kid can watch over and over and over again so they can fully understand X, how to use the quadratic equation, fully understand that. So then when you go to school, you're not going to school in order to learn that. You're going to school in order to have a teacher, a human being who can answer your questions and help you through it. It's kind of the opposite of the way it used to be, where it used to be you'd go to school and then you'd go and do homework. Here you're doing the homework kind of first. And then you're going to school to get help with the homework from a human being who can talk you through it. But but meanwhile, the video explanation is pretty gen, is pretty generic, right? There's one. If you have a good, clear explanation of something, you don't need to have every teacher teach that same thing over and over again. You can have like one really clear video that explains it once and for all, and millions of kids can use that same video. But then when they go to school, that's the that's the more important part of it. So that. I think is seeping more and more into the curriculum, that way of doing things. Um, and I think that that's, that's, that's really revolutionary and, and interesting. Yeah. The flipped classroom. I, I love the idea of that. You actually have a live person there to help you through the practical applications of something right. rather than just kind of the general presentation of these a ideas. Lecture. You don't have to have a lecture. Yeah. 
you know, you can mm-hmm. have. And, and also, I mean, there are teachers who may or may not be that good at lecturing, you know, and may instead have the interpersonal right. skills that are more important to help, but also allows kids to really work at their own pace because you don't have to have the same lecture as everybody else in your class. You may accelerate or you may lag, but you can work and continue to work through the process because it's continuously available to you. You can rewatch it. You can, you know, make sure you fully understand it before you move to the next thing. And I can't, I mean, there's so many times in, in high school, I remember the teacher talking about something and I was totally lost. And then the next week I would be even more lost. And after a while you just go, oh, that's up, brutal. Right? It's like, yes. like you know, oh, that's the story of my, most of I'm my sure academic you, with dyslexia, experience. I'm sure it was even more so. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and once you kind of feel yourself being underwater, um, then you are, are, are just sitting there in the classroom because you're supposed to be. You're just taking up space, but you don't have the tools to then make meaning from these 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 next steps. So you can't progressively follow it. Yeah, yeah. Another aspect of high school we haven't really delved into is is really its social function and how you know your identity, your feelings about yourself, your feelings about art, other things can be um, profoundly affected when you're at a stage of vulnerability that you're, you know, you are forming and somebody can say something to you offhandedly that can redirect your life, right? You can, uh, you can find somebody says something dismissive to you about something you've made or your effort at something. And suddenly you can associate that whole area with humiliation, with trauma, with tragedy um, and by the same token, you're also, you could also be channeled into a positive direction. You could have somebody who is, you could have a great English teacher who encourages you and mo- motivates you. And so you go down that path. You're at, you're really at an incredible crossroads in your life when you are forming your identity and your independence and things can happen that reverberate 50 years later down the road to you, you know, that's, that's why it is so such an important time of life, really, this formation thing, you you no longer have the sort of self assurance that you might have had when you were five, six, seven years old, you're, you know, you're incredibly fragile, and then you emerge from it. And you're kind of, that's your trajectory, you know, and you may have decisions kind of forced upon you at that stage. And then later in life, you may say, that wasn't the right decision for me. And I want to change it. You know, I want I want to recalibrate myself and I want to go in a new direction with my life. Um, you know, and that's, that's an important kind of bookend to high school. Yeah. Looking back, uh, my, <laughs> my, my, my high school experience was socially challenging. <laughs> um, what, what, what happened, for me is because of the dyslexia, um, I felt convinced. I felt that like I had clear evidence that I was stupid. Um, I, you know, all the kind of objective measures of, of intelligence, all these other kids, they can, they're just, they can float through this, I'm still making spelling mistakes. And I try to, to write down the same formula, and I'm putting things in the wrong order. Um, even in my notes, copying from the board. Um, easiest explanation is, I'm stupid. Yeah. And then what are you going to do? How do you how are you going to handle that? For for me, my defense mechanism against that that the the terrible prospect of just sort of forever being a beta um, was uh, to become the class clown and just become a disruptor. If I can't go with this, um, I can distinguish myself by a not trying anymore and B, um, being a disruptive force. 
and uh, so that that came out in all sorts of ways. Um, but there were there were two, two teachers in particular who motivated me and encouraged me in a different way. Um, one of them was a um, history teacher, Leroy Voto, and the other was my biology teacher, Alan Ridley, who really engaged me with ideas and accepted my ideas and listened to those ideas in a different way. And those guys, towards the end of my college career, in one year, just completely turned my world upside down and gave me the motivation to really dig into academics in a way that I never thought I could because I thought that I was just a dumb kid. Right. Yeah, they were obviously life-changing And roles that they played for you. They, I either would have become a historian <laughs> or a biologist, but I realized the historians had to read a lot more books and the biologists could actually just look at the dead squirrel and you know, um, didn't have to do as much reading. And so I, I took the biology route. You know, I was, I was a serial outsider in the sense that I had grown up in lots of different countries and I'd always been uh, an outsider there. And uh, you, you mentioned Pakistan and Australia. What was it that had you bouncing around like? Oh, and this? Israel and and, and Israel and England. Um, you know, my, we just were it was the sixties, and it was my parents got divorced a lot, and we moved a lot. It's, it's a complicated story. I'll tell it some other time. <laughs> but um, yes, but I was always, you know, I always felt like I didn't really fit in, and. So I think over time I started to, ident that became my identity. I couldn't really fit in. So I was just like a person who didn't fit in. And, um, you know, but I tried lots of different things. Like when I was in high school, I was, um, I was in a lot of plays. I directed plays. I was the uh, co-editor of the high school paper. Um, I did a fair amount of art stuff. And, um, you know, and I was a good student and then I went to, to Princeton. So I was like, you know, I, I was successful in that sense, but I always did feel like I was, um, you know, so I was, I naturally became sort of a skeptic and a cynic to some extent because it was part of my identity was to be the outsider, the questioner. Um, and then. And so, so un unpack that for me just a little bit more when you're saying that the outsider what did that look like for you as... It meant I couldn't be like other kids. Kid. Like I didn't know culturally, I didn't know, like I hadn't grown up with the TV shows they grew up with. I didn't know anything about sports because any time I went anywhere, they played different sports and the sports world was different. So I couldn't talk about baseball. I couldn't do any of those things. I sort of knew a bit about it, but I was always afraid that if I tried to have an opinion about something, I would, you know, like... <laughs> like I would immediately be revealed as an imposter. So, um, you know, it was, it was better for me to know st obscure stuff that nobody really knew. So I would know, like I would, I read a lot of books and I, you know, when I listened to music, I didn't really listen to like the music that was popular. I listened to like weird music. Um, when it came to even like the way I dress, like I would dress in a slightly weird way because probably because like, my mother cut my hair and <laughs> knitted me terrible sweaters. But um, yeah, I was, I was sort of, and you know, there comes a point where that becomes, when you're in college, like that's actually better. Because in high school, you really try to fit in. But when you're in college, like you can be weird and that can be your identity. And it's much, college at, at that age when you're, you know, 20, you can be weird. It's like you're almost expected to be weird. So I was much more comfortable at that stage of my life. Um, but I had tried to fit into lots of different groups. My best friend was actually the captain of the basketball team. So I had like that connection to that, to that world. But then I was also, you know, um, 
I was the critic for the for the high school paper. I was the editor. Um, I did illustrations for the yearbook. I was like everywhere. But the funny thing is, I went to the only high school reunion I've been to, which is about two years ago. I went to, I think it was the 30th, 40th, 40th reunion of our class. A lot of people had no idea who I was. There were 35 people in my class. And a large number of them had no idea who I was. I was there for four years. I was I was the yeah. star of the play. I was the editor of the paper. And yet I was kind of invisible in some weird way too. Um, so... What did you find that they, who was remembered? I don't know. I guess it was people who had been there f even longer, who had gone to the school since the kindergarten. I don't know. I think it was people who stayed in the same neighborhood and kind of like stayed connected to the school and did those kinds of things. So people who were like very much of the community, I never felt part of the community. I never, I hadn't grown up in that neighborhood. I mean, I'd lived there since I was 12. But already by then, like, I always felt like, well, they, they already know each other. You know, even though I was there from 12 on, they knew each other and I, they didn't know me. So, yeah, so I was kind of like outsider. And then when I went to college, I was kind of an outsider there too. You know, because there were a lot of kids who had like gone to the same prep schools and now we're all, and then they all went and worked in investment banks and they were, you know, so there was also... <laughs> I just, I just never felt like I was supposed to be part of it. It's ironic because now I kind of lead a community in the community of people who've been there for a long time. But <laughs> for me personally, it was never something I was comfortable with, something I expected. We came back to Phoenix. My wife, a lot of the people who we know are people who my wife went to grade school with and high school with, people who she's had connections with her entire life. And I'm like mystified by that because I just I have no connection with anybody I went to high school with and like maybe one person I went to college with tend to just not make those connections because I've always felt like that wasn't really for me. Like I just expected that nobody would know who I was and never make any kind of impact. So yeah, it's, it's weird how things turn out. So anyway, I think we've gone, uh, we've had an interesting conversation and um, I think high school is a very, uh, is like the third rail and it would be interesting to hear what people have to say about it. So if anybody has any comments or thoughts or memories or things they want to share or questions they want to ask, you can write to us at podcast at sketchbookschool.com and we will read them, certainly. And maybe respond to them, maybe include them in a future broadcast. We'll see. But um, thanks again for joining me, Jack. It was great chatting with you about high school, such as it is. Well, Danny. Really good to talk with you again. Yes, and I'll see you again next time. Until then. Until is, next time. Yeah, this is Art for All. Mm -hmm.